Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu News of Analysis for today. Before we begin, I really hope that all of you now are a part of our Telegram channel. If you have still not joined the channel for any reason whatsoever, what you can do is click on the link given in the description of the video to be a part of our Telegram channel where you will get all the current affairs updates related to the UPSC examination. Now let's begin with the first important article from the editorial section of the Hindu newspaper that is based on the problem of child sexual abuse and child pornography in India. The author here is saying that recently the CBI that is the Central Bureau of Investigation conducted searches across the country under this operation called Meg Chakra. Now, if you have been a regular viewer of our YouTube channel initiatives, you would know that we have already covered the operation Meg Chakra. This was an operation conducted by the CBI on the inputs received from Interpol. So some information was given to CBI that there are certain people across the country that are actually storing child sexual abuse material that is CSAM. They are storing it on cloud based platforms and they are also sharing it with other people. As you know, in India, as per the law, seeking, browsing, downloading or exchanging child pornography is a punishable offense under the IT Act. Now, watching pornography in India is not punishable under the law, but watching child pornography is punishable under the law. It's an extremely, extremely serious offense. The author is saying that despite the CBI conducting the search operation, that is make chakra, the reality is, apart from that, we don't have a lot of good provisions in place in the law to prevent this from happening time and time again. The author gives an example and if you look at nations such as US, UK, they actually have in place a lot of agencies that keep on tracking such kind of material online and they take action against those who upload or who share this. But in India, that is not the case. Let's take an example of the USA first. In USA, we have something called National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. It's a non-profit organization and the purpose of the organization is to ensure that any child sexual exploitation cases are looked into. This organization runs a very successful program called Cyber Tip Line. Cyber Tip Line is a platform using which people across the country can file complaints if they come across such a material in the US. This National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, in fact, also has the authority to notify ISP to block certain material online. Now, what is ISP? ISP is Internet Service Provider. Do understand ISP because this will come in extremely handy in understanding this particular article. ISP, Internet Service Provider, for example, in your case, it can be Airtel, Geo, whoever provides you the broadband. Now, there is a very, very serious debate about the responsibility of the ISP. For example, let's assume that you search some illegal material online. Okay, you search for, let's say, some kind of pornography, which is not allowed in India. And the page opens up on your mobile phone or on your laptop. Now, who should be responsible? Should the person who actually made that website be responsible? Or should the ISP be responsible? Because at the end of the day, many people say it is the responsibility of the internet service provider to block all those websites. So where does the responsibility lie? In India, as per the Supreme Court judgments, ISP should not be held accountable for this. ISP's responsibility will only be when the government specifically tells the ISP that this is a website that we want to block. Then if they don't block the website, then it is their responsibility. But by default, if someone is opening up or searching for any illegal content on the internet, it does not become the ISP's responsibility. Similarly, in Britain, we have something called Internet Watch Foundation. This is again a non-profit organization working in the same manner as the American one. They also try to make a safe online environment for users, mainly for children, with particular focus on child sexual abuse material. They ensure that any criminal content, any illegal content on the internet is taken down as soon as possible. Now, these are examples of within the nation. There is also an international collaboration in this regard which is called In Hope, I-N-H-O-P-E. It's a global network of 50 hotlines where they exchange information from one country to the other and they make sure that any objectionable content online is taken down as soon as possible. About 72% of all the illegal content URLs were removed from the internet within three days notice. Now, to take down something from the internet is not as easy as you might think. 
For example, someone uploads a fake video of you. The government or the police might ask the person to take that video down. But you also know before that video is taken down, it can very easily be downloaded by other people. Once it is downloaded by someone else, they can again make copies of it. So the reality is if something goes online, if something goes on the internet, it is almost impossible to ensure that there are no copies of it. It is also impossible to ensure that it is taken down completely. That is the biggest challenge by far. And that is something that even the most developed nations in the world are actually grappling with. Now, in case of India, as I said, ISP or Internet Service Provider is not given the sole responsibility. They are only held accountable once they are given this information that this is a particular website that needs to be taken down. If then they don't take action, then something can be done. But before that, you cannot take any action against the ISP. ISP are exempted from any liability of third party information means if someone makes an illegal website, puts on an illegal video that does not become the responsibility of the ISP automatically. Apart from the government's efforts in India, we also have something called Arambh India, which is a Mumbai based NGO. They have taken up a similar responsibility as the ones that have been taken up by Internet Watch Foundation. They have also been working on reporting these URLs that contain child sexual abuse or child pornographic material. And they have been able to ensure that a lot of these URLs are blocked. But the author says the problem is India is still not a part of global collaboration such as in hope. This is where India needs to step up. We have to make it a priority as more and more people go online content such as these, which is illegal, which can be extremely, extremely harmful for the society and from the personal point of view is actually taken down from the Internet as soon as possible. Now, if you look at the government's efforts to curtail child sexual abuse, there have been certain initiatives that you can actually give examples of. One of the biggest initiatives in this regard is the POXO Act, that is Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act of 2012. As the name suggests, this is mainly to protect children from offenses which are of sexual assault or sexual harassment nature. As per the definition of this law, any person below the age of 18 years is considered as a child and their welfare is taken care of under this law. It defines any form of sexual abuse, including penetrative and non-penetrative assault, as well as sexual harassment and pornography. Although this law has been in place for about a decade now, but the problem is that its implementation is still questioned. There are many people who say that still filing a complaint under this law with the police is extremely, extremely difficult. The investigation that goes on is not up to the mark and that is why there is still a lot of changes that needs to happen in order to make our children safe across the country. Another initiative is about three years back, CBI also launched unit to check online child abuse cases. See, you have to understand even within the police or the CBI, there are different types of cases that come in time and time again. And that is why you need people who have expertise in solving certain types of cases. That is why forming specialized units to fight off these kind of issues is always a welcome step in the right direction. The next article that we have here is specifically based on coffee plantation and coffee industry in India. The author here is saying that the coffee plantation in India is suffering immensely because of various reasons. In the past few years, there have been a drastic change in the normal climatic condition in the country. For example, in September, there have been very, very high levels of rainfall in the state of Karnataka, which is one of the largest producers of coffee in the entire country, because of which plantations in Karnataka and in the state of Kerala and Tamil Nadu have been destroyed. There has been water clogging because of which all these coffee plantations have actually gone bad. And this is not just about 2022. We have seen multiple such instances of very varied climatic conditions. From 2015 and 2017, we saw dry spells. 2018, 2022, we saw floods, landslides. All of this does not augur well for coffee production in India. Now, as you know, Indian coffee is in a very, very high demand throughout the world. The quality of Indian coffee is appreciated by people who are fond of coffee, especially in America and in the European nation. That is why India has to pay a lot of attention here because coffee export makes up for considerable amount of foreign exchange earning for the government. 
However, because of these climatic conditions, it is anticipated that the coffee production in India will be 30% lower as compared to the usual year-on-year -year production. Now, over three-fourths of the coffee produced in India is actually exported. Now, the problem is when you have lower production, meaning that your export cost will increase because if you have to maintain your profit, now you will want to export at a higher price. When you export something at a higher price, now you have much more competition from other countries because India is not the only country that is producing coffee. So other nations which also export coffee, they will be much happier because now Indian coffee is becoming more and more expensive. This is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is, as per the author, the coffee plantation farmers, they get loans at very, very high interest rates. For example, they have to pay an interest rate close to 12%. While in other coffee growing nations, when they have to go to the bank to apply for a loan, their rate of interest is in the single digit. So in other countries, the cost of coffee growing is much lower as compared to India. Thus, their coffee cost is actually lower and much more competitive. This is the second problem. Then the third problem. It is not just the coffee cost input. The cost of labor is also increasing. As more and more labor has to be employed, these labors come at a higher cost. Meaning that just input cost and the cost of labor makes up 60 to 70 percent of the total plantation expenditure for the people who are into the coffee business. This is why the Indian coffee market is struggling. Indian coffee is seeing a lower productivity and a higher cost of production as compared to other nations such as Vietnam and Brazil. In India, while 65% of the cost goes into labor and input cost, in Brazil it is only 25%. Not just that, the kind of coffee that is grown in India is very unique. India, for example, is the only country where the coffee is grown in shade and it's grown in the elevations, not on plains, which is actually the case in other nations such as Brazil, which is why we need specialized labor to work on coffee plantation in India and they come at a high cost. That is why the Indian coffee is going through its own crisis. One other part of the problem is, although the Indian coffee is appreciated and is sold around the world and it is highly sought after, but even then we have not been able to market it well. Means the brand of India is not really associated with coffee. Yes, India sells Robusta and Arabic variety of coffee at a higher price as compared to the other variety like Colombia. But even then in the international market, when wholesalers go and try to buy coffee, they don't specifically ask for Indian brands. That is why we have to work on marketing as well. If we market it well so that people specifically ask for Indian grown coffee that can also give a much needed boost to the Indian coffee. So just to reiterate once again, number one, we have to work on providing lower rate of interest for the bank loans to the coffee farmers. Secondly, we have to ensure that their input cost and the cost of labor gets reduced. Thirdly, the government also has to ensure that marketing of coffee as an Indian brand actually becomes much, much better at the international stage. All these three things have to be taken into consideration. Right now, India's share in the international coffee market is just 5%. We have the capacity to increase it much, much higher. Now, is there something that the government is doing in this regard? The answer is yes. A few months back, the government did introduce a new bill called the Coffee Promotion and Development Bill of 2022. Right now, the coffee plantation in India is governed by a very old law of 1942. It's an 80-year-old law, which will be replaced by the new bill. Now, this bill has not passed so far, but let me tell you very quickly, what are the provisions of this bill? This bill, as I said, aims to address areas of function of the Coffee Board of India. This bill includes support for production, more research, quality improvement and promotion of coffee apart from developing more skills of people who are working in the coffee plantation. The bill will give more powers to the Coffee Board of India to make better policies which will be for the welfare of the coffee farmers in the long run. The government of India wants to take back its control, wants to have lesser government restrictions and wants to promote sale and consumption of Indian coffee. The major focus will be on research and on marketing skills of Indian coffee manufacturers. 
As I said, this bill has still not been passed, but the expectation is it will pass very soon in the upcoming session of the parliament. Now, coffee plantation in India is something that people really ignore quite a lot because in India, we focus more on tea plantation because tea is consumed in much larger numbers within the country. But coffee, on the other hand, is a very, very important export commodity from India. India ranks sixth amongst the entire world when it comes to coffee producing nations. As we discuss, India produces Robusta and Arabica variety of the coffee. The Indian coffee is very unique in the sense that it is the only coffee in the world grown under shade. It is hand-picked and it is sun-dried in the country. It is mainly confined to three states with Karnataka making up for over half of India's coffee production, followed by Kerala and Tamil Nadu. India exports about three quarters of its coffee, mainly to European and to the Asian market. I'm sure all of you would be aware of the climatic conditions that are required for perfect cultivation of coffee. That is why Torrentian rainfall makes it very difficult for coffee to grow. Coffee plant requires hot, humid climate, temperatures from 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, etc. The next article that we have here is actually a connection between India and Pakistan. So what happened was recently a Pakistan-based wildlife photographer had actually released photos and videos of the great Indian bustard in Pakistan's province of Cholistan. Now, this is where a very interesting conversation had started. The fact is that the great Indian bustard is not found in Pakistan. They were earlier found there, but then the government did not protect them, so they were hunted down. They are mainly found in India's Rajasthan. Now, many people are saying that because Rajasthan shares a border with Pakistan, there is a good chance that these great Indian bustards may have crossed over the border and had entered Pakistan. Now, this is a cause of concern for various reasons. First, their population is extremely limited. Secondly, they are protected in India under various very, very strict laws. In Pakistan, their history of protection has not been great. As we discussed, Pakistan did used to have some great Indian bustards, but all of them were hunted down. So there's a real possibility of these great Indian bustards also being hunted down in Pakistan. The article says there are three of these birds that have entered Pakistan's Cholistan desert. As we can see from the images and the videos released by the wildlife photographer. The photographer has not said that they have come in from India. He doesn't know about it, but this is just an allegation. The probability is that they have flown across the border from India's desert national park that is in Rajasthan. As you would have known, the great Indian bustard is actually the state bird of Rajasthan and is India's most critically endangered bird. It has a population of 150 in Rajasthan, which is about 95% of its total population in the entire world. That is why there are ongoing efforts in India also to increase its population. In fact, 24 chicks are being reared in the desert national park in India to increase its population. Whether or not it has a positive result remains to be seen. I am sure you would have read about the great Indian bustard. There are a lot of steps taken by the government of India to ensure their protection. For example, the government of India has kept the species under the recovery program under integrated development of wildlife protection. It is being implemented by conservation agencies. Our Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has also established a conservation breeding facility within the Desert National Park in Jaisalmer, especially to ensure that the population of the Great Indian Bustard actually increases. The Rajasthan government specifically has also launched the project Great Indian Bustard to increase its population by developing adequate infrastructure and reduce any human presence in the area nearby where they actually live. The next article that we have here is an advisory issued by the Union Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. As per the advisory, the ministry has made it very clear that apart from INB ministry, no other ministry at the central government level or at the state or union territory level should enter its own broadcasting activities in the future. Now, let me explain to you what exactly is this issue and what are they trying to say. There are certain state governments across the country that run their own TV channels. For example, there is one in Tamil Nadu, there is one in Andhra Pradesh. They have their own TV channels on which they advertise their own government's programs. They try to educate people, run educational programs for children, for farmers, etc. Now the union government has said that this is not allowed. 
the only government organization that will engage in broadcasting will be prasar bharti as it does at the union government level and the states cannot do that also even at the union government level other ministries also cannot have their own channels for broadcasting their own activities all this broadcasting from the side of the government will go through prasar bharti only which is a public broadcaster now this advisory has been issued after try had recommended the same and the supreme court also had recommended the same it will impact tamil nadu and andhra pradesh government since they are the ones that run their own initiatives it was in 2012 that try that is the telecom regulatory authority of india had suggested that the center and the state governments should not be allowed to enter into business of broadcasting prasar bharti which is an autonomous body of the government of india should actually be independent to work in this field because if every ministry or every state government engages in their own broadcasting activities then the importance and significance of prasar bharti actually is reduced now there have been certain questions asked about prasar bharti specifically if you look at the upsc papers in the past few years let me share with you certain details of prasar bharti it is not a very old organization this actually came into being in 1990 after prasar bharti act of 1990 was passed now the idea goes back to the time of the emergency when emergency was imposed by the indira gandhi government there was a need felt to have an independent broadcasting agency because at that time the government of india had controlled almost every broadcasting agency the government decided what will be broadcasted what will not be broadcasted and that is when this idea started to actually take shape after about decade or so prasar bharti came into being in 1978 after emergency ended a panel was formed that highlighted need for an independent corporation just like the bbc so bbc channel was established and still works as a part of the british government but it is extremely independent it is autonomous the british government doesn't tell bbc what to publish what not to publish in the same manner the prasar bharti was established In 1979 the idea came up that we should have Prasar Bharti for all India radio and Doordarshan it will look into the working of both of these but the bill could not be passed easily it was only 1990 that the bill could be passed now there have been different views on Prasar Bharti some people say it's an independent body where the government doesn't control everything if you look at the law it says that the chairman and other members of the Prasar Bharti are actually appointed by the president on recommendation of a committee so the bill says that government has no role to play in the appointment however the reality is slightly different because section 22 of the prasar bharti act gives the center the powers to issue directions which it may think necessary in the interest of sovereignty unity integrity of india this is where the debate is most people say that prasar bharti is not really an autonomous body at the end of the day it is under government's control because when the government makes a suggestion to prasar bharti it is not within the powers of prasar bharti to ignore that suggestion it almost becomes mandatory on them to follow that is why prasar bharti is autonomous just in name but in reality it is actually working under the government of india this is a debate that has still carried on till today these are the important articles from the hindu news paper today now a couple of practice questions number 1 prasar bharti is an autonomous body and yet under the central government's control critically analyze second india's coffee industry is going through a period of crisis elaborate with emphasis on the possible ways to come out of this crisis both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each thank you so much for watching the video have a good day ahead and a very very happy dhanteras and happy diwali to all of you